so I'm going to uh, start uh, talking about randomness in cryptography. We know that cryptographic algorithms require randomness. Secret keys must have entropy, and certain primitives must be randomized. And it's common for us to assume perfect randomness in our analysis, um, but we know that real-world randomness is, is imperfect. So we need to ask the question, can we base cryptography on realistic and perfect randomness? And so what do we mean by imperfect randomness? I'm going to define an imperfect randomness uh, source roughly by a family of distributions <coughs> satisfying some property. For example, that they have some, uh, some entropy. And to tolerate an imperfect source means to have one scheme that works for any distribution in this family. So if we restate the question, uh, what we really mean is um, what imperfect sources are enough to do cryptography? So this is uh, easy to answer if we have extractable sources. These are sources that allow the deterministic abstraction of perfect uh, randomness. Um, and uh, so if we have extractable sources, it's, um, it's easy to pretty much do anything that we could do with uh, perfect randomness. The bad news, however, is that a lot of sources are not extractable. So let's look at non-extractable sources. Well, it's obvious that if the source has no entropy, then we can't do, en uh, we can't do crypto. But what about sources that have some entropy? They're just not perfect. Generally, they're not extractable, so that's bad news. And let me give you a very simple example. Um, these are the gamma Santa Vazirani sources. They're parameterized um, by a parameter gamma. And what they, what they do is they, they um, output bits, sequence of bits. Each has a bias of at most gamma. And uh, the bias of each bit can depend on the outcome of all previous bits. And it was shown by Santa Vazirani that these sources are not extractable, namely for, um, for any function that takes any number of coins and outputs a bit. There exists a Santa Vazirani distribution such that the function applied to this distribution has bias uh, at least gamma. So let's, let's go back and look at what we can do uh, in terms of cryptography when, um, depending on the source, we know that we, it's possible to do cryptography. We have extractable sources, and it's impossible if, we, if our source has no entropy. But where do general kind of weak entropy sources fall in this categorization? And the answer is that it's complicated. It depends on the application that we're trying to do. For example, uh, for a BPP simulation, um, a series of works have showed that weak sources uh, are enough to kind of simulate BPP algorithms. And so we might want to ask, well, is this, is this um, can we have the same good news for cryptography? In the case of authentications, the answer uh, is yes and no, but mostly uh, yes. Uh, we know that many, not all, but many weak sources are sufficient uh, to do max and also for signature schemes under appropriate hardness assumptions. And the reason for this is that um, we only require that it's hard to guess or to forge a long string, so having min entropy in the source is, is good enough. <coughs> However, for privacy, um, the results are much more negative. We know that uh, Santa Vazirani sources are not sufficient for unconditionally secure encryption, and this was later strengthened by Doris et al. Um, to show that it, they're also not sufficient for computationally secure encryption, and also commitment, zero knowledge, uh, secret sharing. Uh, this was again later strengthened by uh, Bosley and Doris, in which they showed that if you can generate a k-bit secret key from a distribution, then you can extract almost uh, k almost uh, uniform bits from this distribution. So what this means is that privacy uh, requires an extractable source. Now let me, let me go into kind of the main lemma that allowed uh, Doris et al. To, to show this uh, very negative result for encryption and commitments and um, pretty much any privacy application. And the, the lemma is as follows. Uh, if we consider a weak source X um, and two functions f and g such that f of x and uh, g of x are computationally indistinguishable, then it must be the case that f and g actually agree 
on all but negligible number of, um, of inputs. So why does this lead to the very negative result? Well, in privacy applications, uh, we normally require the adversary to have a negligible advantage in distinguishing distributions. For example, in the case of encryption, um, we, ha we require that encryptions of zero are indistinguishable from encryptions of one. So if we plug this into the lemma, we have that, um, that uh, encryptions of zero and encryptions of one must agree on uh, all but negligible number of coins, and, and so this just doesn't give us a very useful encryption scheme. So now we ask, well, can we, can we base privacy um, on weaker sources if we naturally relax the definition of uh, security? For example, if we consider differential privacy. Um, and uh, if you were here for the tutorial, you, you've seen these definitions um, also in the previous talk, but let me just go over these again. Uh, in differential privacy, we consider uh, databases which we model as arrays of rows, and we say that two databases, uh, D1 and D2, are uh, neighboring if they differ in one entry. And we also uh, care about queries. Uh, these are functions that take as input the database and give us an output, and for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to assume that this output is an integer. Um, and also for the purpose of this talk, uh, let's just uh, limit ourselves to low sensitivity queries. These are queries uh, in which the answer doesn't change by much when um, uh, on, on neighboring databases. So we say that a mechanism is epsilon differentially private uh, with respect to a randomness source S. And for all neighboring databases uh, and all uh, randomness in the source, all possible outcomes Z, um, the probability that the mechanism on input, uh, the first database, gives us the output Z, over the probability that gives us Z on uh, the second database, this is, um, the, these probabilities are pretty much the same. We model this by having the ratio be less than or equal to E to the epsilon, which when epsilon is, is small, this is pretty much just one plus epsilon. And notice here that in the definition, uh, epsilon cannot be negligible. And this is because uh, this would imply that the output of the mechanism is negligibly close uh, for any two different uh, databases. And, and this just doesn't give us anything useful. So uh, because epsilon cannot be negligible, uh, we can hope to overcome the impossibility result of Doris et al. Uh, so I, I said the, the mechanism would not be useful. Let me formalize this um, and give you the definition of utility. We're going to say that a mechanism has a row utility with respect to a source. If we're all databases on all distributions in the source, the expected value of the difference of the, um, the true answer of the query, f of d, um, and the output of the mechanism is less than rho. So privacy and utility are definitions that kind of seem to be at odds with each other. And so we ask, um, can we have kind of a good trade-off between privacy and utility? And this inspires uh, the following definition. We say that a family of mechanisms is accurate and private with respect to a source. If for all epsilon greater than zero, uh, there is a mechanism in this family that is epsilon differentially private and has utility that is a function of epsilon. Um, and uh, from now on, I'm just going to call these mechanisms non-trivial, uh, just because accurate and private is, is quite long. So let me show you an example of um, kind of some non-trivial um, mechanisms. These are the so-called additive noise mechanisms. Um, they follow the following t template, which is they compute the true answer to the query f of d. And then they add some noise from an appropriate distribution. And this template has been followed by many works in the literature. Uh, but I'll give you just a very simple example, which is um, that the noise distribution from which we're going to sample the noise uh, is going to be the Laplacian distribution with mean 0 and uh, standard deviation, which is order 1 over epsilon. 
And uh, the work of uh, Dworkenthal um, in 2006 showed that uh, this mechanism is epsilon differentially private and has order one over epsilon utility with respect to the uniform distribution. And therefore, by our definition, um, these are non-trivial mechanisms uh, with respect to uniform. So now our question becomes, are weak entropy sources sufficient to achieve uh, non-trivial mechanisms? And uh, let me show you our results. Um, we only consider the case of Santa Vazirani sources. And we show uh, both negative and positive results. Uh, the negative result we show is that additive noise mechanisms cannot be non-trivial with respect to Santa Vazirani. But most surprising is our positive result. Um, we showed that uh, we show a non-trivial SV robust mechanism for low sensitivity functions. And why is this surprising? Well, it gives us a separation between traditional and differential privacy. Um, as I said before, traditional privacy, um, we kind of know that you can't base it on Santa Vazirani sources, but here we show that you can achieve differential privacy with Santa Vazirani sources. So I'll start by telling, um, by giving you, um, by showing the, you the, our negative result. Uh, but first, let me show you um, a very uh, simple lemma that only talks about sets and Santa Vazirani distributions. So let's consider two sets, uh, T1 and T2, such that the size of T1 is greater than the size of T2. And let's define sigma to be the ratio of the size of everything that's in T2 but not in T1 over the size of T2. And you can, you can look at this uh, quantity sigma as kind of a degree of disjointness. So for example, if the, if the sets are disjoint, sigma is going to be equal to one, whereas if uh, T2 is contained in T1, sigma is going to be zero. And what we can show is that there always exists a Santa Vazirani uh, distribution such that if you sample a coin from this distribution, the probability that it lands in T1 over the probability that it lands in T2 is greater than or equal to one plus gamma sigma times the ratio of the size of the sets. Um, and if you look at the, the probability as taken from the uniform distribution instead of um, from the Santa Vazirani distribution, the ratio of these probabilities, it's actually just going to be the ratio of the size of the sets. So this um, factor of one plus gamma sigma is really just the factor by which the Santa Vazirani distribution can increase uh, this ratio of probabilities. Okay, so why, why do we care this at all? Um, well, in differential privacy, um, let's, uh, let's fix uh, neighboring databases, D1 and D2, and a query F and an uh, outcome Z. And let's define uh, T1 and T2 as follows. Um, TB is simply going to be the set of coins that uh, make M output Z on uh, database DB. And again, for differential privacy, we're, con we're concerned um, to upper bound this ratio, which just turns out to be uh, the ratio of the probability that if we sample a coin from the distribution, it lands in T1 over the probability that it lands in T2. And by our lemma, uh, this is going to be greater than or equal to one plus gamma sigma, which kind of explains, um, okay, um, and then uh, additive noise mechanisms, uh, T1 and T2 are, you can show that they're disjoint. So sigma, which is the degree of disjointness, uh, is going to be equal to one. Um, so this, uh, this ratio of probabilities that we care for for differential privacy is going to be lower bounded by one plus gamma. And so if we want to upper bound by one plus epsilon, then this means that epsilon must be greater than or equal to gamma. So it kind of explains why we can't have epsilon differential privacy for epsilon less than gamma um, with additive noise mechanisms. Um, so we can conclude something a little bit more general, and this is that uh, epsilon differential privacy with respect to Santa Vazirani distributions requires uh, sigma to be uh, order of epsilon, which means that the intersection of these two sets, T1 and T2, must be really big. 
Um, it must be a one minus epsilon fraction of the size of T2. This kind of motivates uh, the following definition, um, which is definition of consistent sampling. Uh, it's similar to definition that has already appeared in the literature. Um, and what we say is that a mechanism has epsilon consistent sampling if for all neighboring databases, this quantity, this degree of disjointness, uh, disjointness that I described before is less than epsilon. And it's kind of e very easy to show that if M is epsilon consistent, then M is also epsilon differentially private with respect to the uniform distribution. The proof is very simple, I won't go over it, but you can see it's, it's only one line. Okay, so um, with this definition in mind and knowing that um, we kind of need to satisfy this definition to hope to have SV robust mechanisms, we're going to uh, define a new mechanism and our mechanism, what it's going to do, it's going to uh, compute the true answer to the query, add Laplacian uh, noise as before, but then what it's going to do is it's going to round the outcome to the nearest multiple of one over epsilon. Uh, utility is conserved. Um, it, we still have order of one over epsilon utility. Um, but I want to convince you that uh, we now have epsilon consistent sampling. And so if we look at, um, um, at the, the the previous mechanism, the one that just added noise without rounding, um, and consider databases D1 and D2, where the query differs, so it's zero in D1 and one in D2. Here I'm just showing um, kind of the, the sets of coins that will make uh, the mechanism output, uh, for example, zero and for D1, um, here it would output uh, one with D2. And you can see, for example, if we fix an outcome, uh, for example, zero, then um, these sets that here, this would be T1 and this would be T2, they're completely disjoint. Now when we round, what we're actually doing is we're taking one over epsilon number of these uh, intervals and kind of putting them together, merging them. For example, if you have epsilon equals to one half, um, as I have here, then what you're doing is you're kind of uh, rounding to the nearest even number and uh, putting together kind of two little intervals. And now uh, your outcomes are only going to be multiples of one over epsilon, which are in our case are, is two. And now you can see, sorry, now you can see that um, these sets T1 and T2 start overlapping. And this, this is what we want for epsilon consistent sampling. So as I explained, this, this will guarantee that kind of T1 and T2 will start intersecting, um, which will help us overcome our lower bound. Now the question becomes, can we implement this in an SV robust manner? And the answer is yes, but it's highly non-trivial. In fact, doing this uh, takes, it was pretty much uh, the bulk of our technical work. Uh, it turns out that not every implementation is SV robust. Uh, which means that epsilon consistent sampling is necessary, but it's not sufficient um, to handle Santa Vazirani sources. This leads us uh, to define epsilon as V consistent sampling. Um, it's a natural definition. It doesn't reference the Santa Vazirani distributions. And we show that it's sufficient for SV robustness. And to ensure SV consistency, what we're going to do, we're going to um, use arithmetic coding. And here we need to be very careful with finite position. So just to summarize, um, we, we consider SV uh, sources uh, in differential privacy, and we show that differential privacy is possible uh, with uh, Santa Vazirani sources. This shows the separation between traditional and differential privacy. Um, but we know that uh, in the real world, that um, imperfect randomness doesn't have this very structured um, definition of, that Santa Vazirani has where uh, each bit is, is biased with uh, gamma. It doesn't, it doesn't really follow that. So, so we leave open the question of um, how to, can we achieve differential privacy with, with other weak sources? And um, our paper, and our paper also 
want to motivate the use of consistent sampling uh, as a design paradigm for uh, future differentially private mechanisms. Um, this has found useful applications in an upcoming CCS paper um, that talks about uh, floating point ar arithmetic um, in differentially private mechanisms. Um, thank you.